you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and while you're turning there, I want to welcome those of you who are gathering with us at Loudon and Prince William, Montgomery County on Main Avenue. It's good to be together across Washington around God's Word. We're walking together through the book of 1 John in the Bible, and we're working together to memorize the first chapter. So learning one verse a week. We're on week two in our memorization. And I've got to tell you how encouraged I was yesterday. So I was out at the Nationals game for Faith Day. I mentioned last week I was throwing out the first pitch, my one opportunity in life to be like the great Bob Gibson and by God's grace due to incredible coaching from my 10-year-old son, I got the ball across the plate. So I was very thankful. <laughs> he, was, he was so funny too. He, he, he told me afterwards, he said, Dad, if you'd have bounced it up there, I still would have been proud of you. Uh, it was like a dad talking to his son, except, except it was totally reversed. But he was like, when you threw it across the plate, I was like, yes. So, uh, and he was like really nervous for me. Anyway, it was... It was good. So, but more importantly, when I was, so I was walking out of the field and a member of McLean up in the stands gets my attention and starts yelling. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we, and she's like yelling out 1 John 1-1 one, one across National Stadium. I loved it. So, uh, so anyway, so let's say it together now. So we're going to add in verse 2 as well. Um, and we'll do this twice. 1 John 1, 1 and 2. You ready? All right, here we go. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Hey, that was well done. We started kind of veering off a little bit at the end. And it's complicated, isn't it? And I think I may have even said one phrase in there wrong. I think our hands have touched instead of have touched with our hands. So let's try it again. Make sure we get it all right. But, but uh, all right. So here we go. First John 1, 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. All right, well done, well done. Hiding God's word in our hearts, so persevere, like don't give up. Okay, don't be like, oh, we're only two verses in. I can't do this. Like, you can do this. Just remember Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. Like the, his life will bear fruit. In it he will prosper. You want real prosperity in the world? I hide God's word in your heart. So, so press on. All right, that leads us to 1 John chapter 2. And, well, before we dive into this text, I... I want to invite you just to, to look up here because um, my heart is particularly heavy coming into this text. Um, as your pastor is one of your pastors, I pray continually, like daily for your good. And I want to work continually, daily for your good, which means that when I stand before you, I long to encourage you, to comfort you. This is not an easy world we live in. I know that any given week when I stand before you, there are many of you who are just hurting in all kinds of different ways, and I want to saturate you with God's great love for you. At the same time, I know that God's love is sometimes expressed in words that are hard to hear and hard to say. And I really believe the best way I can love you 
is by saying what the Bible is saying, even when it's hard to say or hear. So I was reading a, a quote from the great African-American preacher Lemuel Haynes and he said, the pastor will not be ambitious of saying fine things to win applause, but of saying useful things to win souls. He will not entertain his audience with empty speculations or vain philosophy, but with things that concern their everlasting welfare. Jesus Christ, him crucified, will be the great topic and darling theme of his preaching If he means to save souls like a skillful physician, he will endeavor to lead his patients into a view of their maladies and then point them to a bleeding savior as the only way of recovery. The faithful watchman will give the alarm at the approach of the enemy, will blow the trumpet in the ears of the sleeping sinner and will endeavor to wake him. And I I feel like today in particular is one of those days where I'm trying to blow a trumpet sound an alarm, wake us with God's word in a way that I hope shows God's love. So let me just cut right to the chase. I am concerned that the greatest challenge facing you and me in our faith right now is not persecution from the world. So that is a challenge that many of our brothers and sisters around the world face. But I don't think it's our greatest challenge. I'm concerned that the greatest challenge facing you and me and our faith right now is not persecution from the world, but seduction by the world. Worldliness. Charles Spurgeon said a century ago, he said, I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. He said, put your finger on any prosperous page in the church's history and you will find a little marginal note that says, in this age, people could really see where the church began and where the world ended. I think we live in a day where you can't tell where the church begins and the world ends. Study after study, it's not even just kind of intuition, like it's reality. The lifestyles of professing Christians look just like the world around us. We are just as materialistic, just as sexually immoral, just as self-focused. Racially, we're even more divided than the world. We're just as materialistic. Like Our spending patterns are strikingly similar to the world around us. Our giving patterns are strikingly similar to the world around us. 6% of professing Christians tithe. 6%. And this is not just outside of us. This is us in this gathering. We know from Giving patterns here that the overwhelming majority of people in this gathering don't tithe. We spend our money on all the same things the world spends money on. We're just as self-focused, just as sexually immoral. The percentage of professing Christian men who view pornography is virtually the same as non-Christian men. Men all across this gathering have viewed pornography over the last week, the last month. Professing Christians are practically as likely to have sex outside of marriage, whether you're single or married, doesn't matter. Sexual activity with someone who is not your spouse is almost just as common among professing Christians as it is among non-Christians in the world. For students and singles, this is just normal. For so many of you in marriages, professing Christians are just as likely to divorce as non-Christians. Just as likely. Some studies have even shown that divorce is more common among professing Christians than non-Christians. Other studies show that marital abuse is even just as common. In parenting, the priorities of professing Christian parents for their kids look virtually identical to the priorities of non-Christian parents. We cart our kids all over town in the exact same way that non-Christian parents do, teaching our kids to be 
good at the things that the world says are most important, sports, entertainment. We took a survey in our student ministry. We asked students, what, if anything, is hindering your family's spiritual life? And over 80% said busyness and schedule was the top hindrance. And it's not necessarily what our kids are getting that's bad. It's what our kids aren't getting. They spend hours in practices for this or that and hours in video games or hours in front of a screen and minutes, if any time at all, in the Word or in prayer with their moms and dads. And The effects are evident. Like All the research we hear says that many of our kids who grow up in church walk away from their faith after leaving the home. I think about my four kids. Like, I, we just can't be content with that. Something needs to change. We're living just like the world. We look just like the world. We in this gathering love this world and part of our text today, so if you look at it in verse 15, the Bible says, God is saying to us right now, do not love the world or the things in the world, period. Like, underline that, highlight that, star that. That's God speaking directly to us. Now, knowing, as we're going to see, there's a lot of things that verse doesn't mean. It doesn't mean don't love the people of this world. We know God loves the people of this world. John 3, 16, so much he gave his only son to die for them. We saw last week in 1 John 2, 2. Jesus died as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And it doesn't mean don't enjoy anything in the world. We know, First Timothy 6, God has given us all kinds of good things in the world to enjoy. Family, a good meal with friends, a, a baseball game to enjoy. So we love people in the world. We enjoy good gifts that God gives us in the world. But what John is saying, or the Bible is commanding here, is that we must not love the ways and practices of a world that is in so many ways set up against the word of God. A world that goes on day by day in such a way that it's just second nature to us. Gratifying self, indulging self, entertaining self, exalting self without regard for the character or commands of God. And John is saying, the Bible is saying here, the church should look different. The church should look very different. Our schedules should look different. Our spending should look different. Our marriages should look different different, our parenting should look different, our purity, our possessions, our love, our lives should look different. Not for the sake of being different, but because we love God more than we love this world. He says right after this, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And that's what I want you to see today. I want you to see the relationship between God's love for us and how we look at the world around us. And then John closes with this warning. Did you see it in verse, or just look at it in verse 17. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do you hear that? Like that is an eternal warning. God is saying right now, just hear him speaking. He says, if you love this world, you will perish with this world. Don't love the world. It will destroy you. Instead, love God, do his will, and you will live forever. The choice could not be more simple in that sense. Remember, that's why John's writing this book, so we might know we have eternal life. And in this book, he's warning. So we're going to see it in the uh, verses next week right after this. That some people are professing to be Christians who are not. And this is why my heart is particularly heavy today. Because when I hear statistics like I just walked through uh, the number of professing Christians whose lives look just like the world, I just can't avoid one conclusion. Like many professing Christians are not Christians. Potentially even professing Christians in this gathering right now are not Christians. And I want to be so careful and wise in the way I say that because for, for true followers of Christ in this gathering right now, the last thing I want to do is cause you to doubt your faith. At the same time, for those of you who are deceived into thinking you are a Christian when you are not, the last thing I want to do is comfort you in your present state before God. I want to warn you with everything in me. And I see 
John doing both these things in this book. He is encouraging followers of Christ and he's warning those who say they're Christians but are deceived over and over again. We've already seen him say, if you say you're a Christian yet you believe this, you're deceived. If you say you're a Christian and you live like this, you're a liar. Talk about politically incorrect. To say to some, maybe many people who say that you're a Christian, to say, actually you're a liar. But if that's true, don't you want to know that? Doesn't any one of us want to know if we're deceived in some way? Especially if we're deceived about our eternity? I want to know that. I want to know the truth about my life for eternity. So I'm just operating under an assumption that you do too. So how do you know? How do you know that you have eternal life? This is the question First John is answering continually. And I I don't believe this is just important for professing Christians. I know there are some, many, who are visiting with us today and you're not a Christian. Maybe you've come at the invitation of a friend. Maybe you're exploring Christianity. We want you to know we are glad you're here. You are welcome here. And I really believe that what we're talking about here is vitally important for you as well. Because if you're really going to evaluate Christianity then it's really important for you to know what Christianity actually is. I saw a recent news article. The headline said, Exposing America's Biggest Hypocrites, Evangelical Christians. First line of the article. It says, Christianity in America, or should I say, the single greatest cause of atheism today. Obviously, we could argue about whether that's true. And I think we'd certainly agree that many people see a disconnect between what Christians say and how Christians live and walk away wanting nothing to do with it. I'm guessing some who are even visiting have experienced that before. And on top of that, I want you to know you have eternal life. So here's what I want to do. I want us to think together for the next few minutes about false foundations for assurance of eternal life and true foundations for assurance of eternal life. What I mean by that, the Bible's saying here in 1 John over and over again, this is how you know you have eternal life. So we're going to see that over and over again today in what we're reading. These are the foundations for assurance that you have eternal life. What's interesting though is the foundations the Bible gives are very different from the foundations I see and hear so many people today standing on when they say, yeah, I know I'm a Christian. Very different. I see, I hear so many false foundations of assurance that are not mentioned in the Bible. So I'm going to start by listing some of them out and then move to the true foundations for assurance. And I, uh, obviously I I don't know uh, everybody in this gathering or what's going on in your heart and your life. I've just prayed that God would take this word and speak it to your heart and that you would be open to hear whatever God is saying to you in the next few minutes. So, false foundations for assurance. So, how do you know you're a Christian? How do you know that you have eternal life? Here's eight false foundations I hear all the time. I hear people, one, point to their religious heritage. People say, I was born a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. The Bible never teaches that where you were born or where you grew up is any guarantee of eternal life. Second, others point to church involvement. I talk to a ton of people who say, yeah, I go to church every once in a while or every week even. And while gathering with the church is an essential part of following Christ, the Bible never says that going to church by itself is any basis for assurance in eternity. You can go to church every single Sunday of your life and not have eternal life. People say, I live a moral lifestyle. I'm a good person. I'm kind, honest, generous. A lot more than a lot of people in the world. Yet the Bible clearly teaches that a moral lifestyle doesn't assure anyone eternal life. Just ask the Pharisees, the great law keepers. And their conversations with Jesus all throughout the Bible. People point to intellectual knowledge. People will say, I know that I have eternal life because I believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. So I know I'm a Christian. When actually that merely puts you on the same plane as the devil himself. The devil believes Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. He does not have eternal life. That's no assurance for eternal life. 
People point to active ministry. Look at all I do in the church or for the church or for others and this way or that way. As soon as you hear that, think Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and your name perform many miracles, do all these things? And I will tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Ladies and gentlemen, it is possible to do all kinds of things in the church, even be called a pastor and not know Christ. People point to active ministry, a guilty conscience, another foundation. I feel bad when I sin, so I must be a Christian. When the reality is all kinds of people feel bad when they do wrong. We have a whole system of pop psychology filled with man-made ways to cover over our guilt. And we've even created a supposedly Christian version of it when it's nothing more than self-help wrapped in spiritual terms. We look for assurance and positive thinking. Well, I think I'm a Christian. But think about it. If that was a foundation for assurance, then no one could ever be deceived. It's kind of the whole point of deception. Think about millions of people in cults who claim that they are Christians when the Bible clearly teaches they are not. We want to know what God thinks, not what we think. And here's one more. False foundation for assurance. A past decision. So I hear people say, I know I'm a Christian because I remember when I signed a card, prayed a prayer, said these words, went forward, I remember right where I was when I did that. Now I want to be really, really careful here because many people can, many true Christians can remember the exact moment when they placed their faith in Christ. And their heart and life was changed forever. But at the same time, there are many people who signed a card, prayed a prayer, said some words, walked an aisle, joined a church, but today and for years have not been walking with God and have no desire to walk with God. They do not have eternal life. Please hear this. The Bible does not say, you won't find one verse in 1 John that says, as long as you said some words or signed a card or joined a church one time, you can know you have eternal life. That's not in the Bible. Now again, that doesn't mean there wasn't a point in the past when you truly began a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. But when, follow this, when John writes this letter to help people know they have eternal life, he doesn't say, look back to the past. He says, look to the present. And this is key. Please pay attention here. There are like landmines everywhere in what we're talking about today. So John is not addressing how you become a Christian as much as he is addressing how you know you're a Christian. And those are two very different things. How do, how do you become a Christian? What does the Bible teach about that? Romans 10, 9, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Mark 1, 15, repent and believe the gospel. So if you are visiting with us today, exploring Christianity, this is how you become a Christian. You realize that God is good and holy and we, you and I, we've all sinned against God. We've turned from his ways to our ways. Looks different in all of our lives, but we are separated from God as a result and we deserve his judgment forever. But you also realize that God loves us so much that he came to us in the person of Jesus. And Jesus lived the life that we could never live without sin. Then though he had no sin to pay a price for, he chose to die on a cross for our sin. He paid the price for your sin, for my sin. He died on a cross and then he rose from the dead in victory over sin so that anyone, anywhere who repents and believes, turns from sin, says, God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm turning from my sin to myself and I'm trusting in Jesus to save me from my sin as Lord of my life. When you do that, you are reconciled to God, forgiven of your sin, restored to relationship with him forever. That is how you become a Christian according to the Bible. At which point then, the Bible teaches, here's how you know you're a Christian. So here's how you know that Jesus is the Savior and Lord of your life. Here are the true foundations for assurance. So see the difference there. So what I want to show you is four foundations for assurance in 1 John 1 and 2. Even in that though, I want to be careful. I want to be careful not even to in any way imply. So here's the boxes you need to check off in order to become a Christian. No, please hear this. In order to become a Christian, you repent and believe what we just said. And then, these are the questions that the Bible gives us to ask so we might examine our hearts and know that we're not deceived. 
How can we know that repentance and belief are true, are realities in our lives? How can we know that we're not deceived? How can we know that we have eternal life? Ask four questions. One, are you trusting in Jesus alone as the Son of God and Savior of your sin? So I just encourage you, just personalize this. I, I am writing these things to you, John says. I'm preaching these things today. So you may know you have eternal life. How do you know? Ask these questions. One, are you trusting in Jesus alone as the Son of God and Savior of your sin? That's, that's what John says in 1 John 5, 13, this, the purpose statement of this book. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's how you know, by believing in him. We saw this last week. You look in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, we're deceived. And he continues. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You get down to verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Chapter 2, verse 2. We looked at it last week. Jesus is the propitiation or sacrifice for our sins. So ask the question, are you trusting in Jesus right now as the Son of God, God in the flesh, who came to offer his life as a sacrifice for your sin? And if not, you do not have a lot of reason for assurance that you have eternal life. Just put this together with some of the false foundations for assurance. There are many Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses right now who are great, moral, loving, kind, good people who are devoted to their faith and think, would say they're Christians, yet they are explicitly denying that Jesus is uniquely God in the flesh. As a result, they are deceived. Similarly, there are people today who made past decisions, walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, said some words. But if you were to ask them today, are you trusting in Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of your sin? They would say, absolutely not. And if they aren't trusting in Jesus as the Savior of their sin, they don't have much reason for assurance of eternal life. They're not believing in the one who is able to give eternal life. Which caused you to wonder, well, what, what happened years ago when this or that? And we'll dive into that more next week when we see these who have falsely professed Christ. But the reality is, trusting in Jesus is necessary for eternal life. One more example. There are church members who believe in Jesus and at the same time believe that their church attendance and all they do for Jesus will earn their way to heaven. And as long as you believe that, you will have little assurance of your salvation. I, I think about many Catholic friends I have. This is our conversations all the time revolve around because the Catholic Church officially teaches that we are saved from our sin, not by faith alone, but by faith plus works. Which is why many, my Catholic friends, when we talk, and I asked, do you know you have eternal life in heaven? They say, I hope so. I believe in Jesus and I hope my good works will get me there. But good works do not save us from sin. Jesus alone can save us from sin. This is Ephesians 2.8. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works. Assurance comes not from trusting in your works, but by trusting in Jesus alone as Savior of our sins. Not Jesus plus anything. Just Jesus. Period. So are you trusting in Jesus alone as the Son of God and Savior of your sin? That's the first question. Now, that doesn't mean that our, well, well, let's put it a question. Does that mean then that our, our works, our lives don't matter at all? No. That's why Ephesians 2.10, right after saying we're saved by grace, says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. works. So that leads right into the second question we ask when looking for assurance of eternal life. So one, are you trusting in Jesus alone as the Son of God and Savior of your sin? Then two, are you obeying Jesus alone as the Lord of your life. Are you obeying Jesus alone as Lord of your life? Just ask that question. Examine your heart right now. Hear the word of God. This is where we finished in 1 John 2 last week, verse 3. Hear God's word. 
This is not me speaking. This is God saying, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Those verses could not be any more clear or more critical. So first, realize this is not saying that we need to obey God in order to be saved from our sin. That would contradict everything we've already seen in the Bible. We see it over and over again in the Bible. We are saved from our sin by trusting in Jesus alone as Son of God and our Savior. And then, this is how we know that trust is real. We do what Jesus says. If we trust him, then we follow him. We keep his commandments. We obey his word. We walk in his way. Why? So that we can be saved? No. We keep his commandments because we have been saved. This is how we know we have been saved by Jesus. We live like Jesus. We trust him, so we obey him as the Lord of our lives. Obeying Jesus is not a condition for knowing Jesus. Obeying Jesus is a sign that we know Jesus. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Like, what is a Christian? Just go common sense here. A Christian is a follower of Christ. So are you following Christ? And if the answer to that question is no, then it really doesn't make sense to call yourself a Christian. It's a sad commentary on Christianity in our day when so many people profess to be Christians, yet their lives so, show so little to no fruit of following Christ beyond maybe church attendance, moral decency, but again, you can have, do those things and not be a Christian. The question is, are you obeying Jesus alone as the Lord of your life? Now I want to be careful here. Much like I mentioned last week, the the picture here is definitely not holy perfection. It's not that Christian never sins. Then if you do sin, then you should doubt your salvation. No. The whole point at the end of 1 John 1, beginning of 1 John 2, is that if, when you sin, you confess your sin. That's just it. For the Christian, when he or she sins, there is confession, repentance, there's sorrow over sin, there's a turning from sin, a desire for change, a working by God's grace to obey Jesus as the Lord of your life. That's the word here. It's a great word in the original language of the New Testament here. When it's talking about obeying, it means desiring obedience. Not you have to, it's you desire, you want to follow Jesus. You're working in your life to obey him because you trust him and his word and his ways. So when I talk to the couple who is living together outside of marriage and they say, we are Christians and we are living together outside of marriage, the reality is they are deceived. God has spoken clearly about this. So it's legitimate at that point to ask, okay, are they followers of Jesus? Because it sure looks like they're deliberately disobeying Jesus. And if when I say that in love and show in God's word, they say, oh, we see that in God's word now. Yes, yes, we need to trust his ways. So we, we confess our sins. and One of us is going to move out. We want to obey Jesus. Then you walk away thinking, that sure looks like they're followers of Christ. But if on the other hand, when seeing this in God's word, they say, yeah, we're still going to live together anyway. That's going to show it's doubtful that they are followers of Jesus. And that may sound strong, but even as I say that, I realize I'm not using language as strong as the Bible is. The Bible says clearly in this situation, if you say you know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you don't even desire or want to work to keep his commandments, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. John does not say to that couple, well, as long as you said some words at a moment in the past, you're okay. So I ask you, The Bible asks you, are you obeying Jesus alone as the Lord of your life? Is the posture of your heart toward Jesus, I want to follow you. I trust that your word is better than my way, so I want to do whatever you want me to do. And I know I'm not sinless in that. 
I, I know I still sin, but I sure want to sin less and less and less. And I want to know you more and more and more. I want to obey you more and more and more. This is how you know you have eternal life. Are you obeying Jesus as the Lord of your life? Third question. Are you showing the love of God to others? Are you showing the love of God to others? This is where we pick up in chapter 2, verse 7. Hear God's word. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going. So to briefly explain what the Bible just said, the command to love others is obviously not new. It's been around from the beginning. But that command to love took on a whole new meaning when Jesus came. The light of the world left his throne in heaven to come to our darkness in love for us. In love, he laid down his life for us. And now, for all who have trusted in him as Savior and Lord, he lives in us, which means we love like Jesus loves. We lay down our lives in love for people around us. We selflessly serve, compassionately care for people around us. And not just people like us, people unlike us. We love even our enemies. We provide for those in need among us. And anyone who says he or she is a follower of Jesus, but this kind of love is not evident in their lives, the Bible is saying they're not in the light. They're still in the darkness. John will say this in other ways in the chapters to come. Chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. This is how we know we have eternal life, because we have a whole new love for people around us, specifically in the church. Three verses later, he says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Again, that's not love others so that you can earn your way to eternal life. This is when Jesus, who is eternal life and love, is living in you, then his love will be expressed through you. I was talking with a student last week who is, yeah, at this point, not very interested in Christianity. And was telling me, my parents say they're Christians, and people think they're strong Christians, but I watch the way they treat each other at home. My dad clearly doesn't love my mom in the way he treats her. My mom doesn't love my dad with the way she talks about him, and I just don't get it. Is this what Christianity is about? And the answer is no, it's not. For those who are in Christ, again, not one of us is perfect. But remember, not holy perfection, but holy direction. There is a desire to love and a working to love as Christ's love that is evident in the true Christian's life. It's evident in their relationships. The Bible says the same thing in the book of James. When professing Christians in the church there are ignoring the poor. And James says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. One of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. It's dead. Deceived. In other words, people who claim to be Christians, to be followers of Christ, yet ignore the poor right around them? Even in the church, they're deceived and they need to ask if they're really Christians. And it's not that they need to start loving in order to become Christians. It's that they need to repent and believe in Jesus, ask God to give them a new heart that loves like Jesus loves. Which leads right in the last question. So the fourth foundation for assurance in these verses. Not just are you showing the love of God to others, but are you experiencing the love of God for you? Are you experiencing the love, love of God for you? And this is where, uh, as I was studying this text this week, just all the light bulbs just went on. So I want you to follow this. So what John does, starting in verse 12, is he starts to encourage the true Christians, those who were trusting in Christ and obeying Christ. Again, not perfectly, but, but working to obey Christ by the grace of God in them, loving others. And he says, verse 12, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who's from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. 
I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. Now keep in mind that when John writes to little children here, he's referring to all the followers of Christ in the church and around Ephesus by extension to all of us. He's like a father to them, us in the faith. He's calling them children of God. And then he writes to fathers and young men, not to be exclusively focused on males in the church, but as a picture of those who are older or younger, either physically or in the faith. We're not sure, entirely clear which, but his point is the same. And it's repetitive. He says the same thing multiple times. And notice how his encouragement to them is just totally based on God's love for them. He says, you, I'm writing to you, you've been forgiven of all your sins by God. And you know him who is from the beginning. You know God. And the word John uses for know there is to know by experience. Not just to know about God in your mind, but to know God in your heart, in your life. As we've already seen in 1 John, you have fellowship with God. And as a result of fellowship with God, his word is in your heart. You have his victory in your lives over sin and temptation amidst trial and suffering. You have overcome the evil one. So see the picture here of the true Christian, the man, woman, student who has been forgiven by the love of God and is now experiencing the love of God and intimate knowledge of God and fellowship with God on a daily basis in the world. This is eternal life, experiencing the love of God. This is the true Christian life, experiencing the love of God. Which is why, so now here's the light bulbs. Make the connection here. So the next verse starts where we started today. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Because if anyone loves the world, then what? The love of the Father is not in him. So follow this. Again, picture the world as a system of thoughts, ideas, practices, pleasures that are set up against God and his word and his ways. And the Bible is saying clearly here that that system And the love of God cannot coexist. So love for the world and love for God cannot coexist. And he defines love for the world as the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. Notice the first two are desires for what we don't have. The third is pride in what we do have. So think the desire for material possessions, sexual pleasure, selfish pursuits, higher positions, greater luxuries, nicer comforts, in any ways that pull us away from God and his ways. At which point you might ask, wait, should I not desire a home? Do you have a house? Should I not desire a spouse? Should I not desire children? Love children? Love a spouse? Should I not desire friends? Should I not desire a job? Some rest, some relaxation, some fun, a healthy body, a variety of other good things in the world? Should I not desire these things? And the answer is no. You shouldn't. Unless those desires are driven first and foremost by a desire for God. Follow with me here. This is so key. Do you desire a spouse, for example, merely for selfish pleasure? Or do you desire a spouse so that God might be glorified in the selfless love you might show that spouse? Do you desire marriage so that you might grow to love and enjoy God more with this husband or wife as you display the gospel for his glory in the world? Is that your desire for marriage? Because you desire God. Desire for a spouse is intended to be grounded in a desire for God. As is everything else, the Christian life is a life in love with God over anything and everything in this world. Which means now anything and everything in this world is simply an opportunity to know and show the love of God. And that changes the way you view your life. You're thinking, well, it sounds like God is just your life. That's right. You're a follower of Christ. He's your life. And everything in your life revolves around him. So now, it just changes everything. 
As a student or young single, so many of you are just praying for you this week. You're surrounded by so many temptations to worldliness that you wonder if it's even possible to love God in the middle of it. And it is. The ways of this world are passing away. I guarantee you that 30, 40 years from now, 30, 40 billion years from now, you will not regret living today with the love of God above all else. You will not regret living according to God's ways instead of the ways of this world. I guarantee you. It just changed the way you view your life. It's totally different. And this goes against all the messages this world is sending, every single one of us. It's changed the way you view life, marriage, parenting. So we're no longer parenting to raise children to be successful in all the ways of the world that are going to pass away. We're setting them up for destruction if that's where we're focused. No, we raise children to know and love God, and that changes everything. So sure, we'll raise them to get a job, but not because we're training them for a casual, comfortable Christian spin on the American dream, but because we're training them to love and glorify God by working hard at a job, to love and glorify God by providing for a family, to love and glorify God by spending their lives for the spread of his gospel in a world of urgent spiritual and physical need. When the love of the Father is in you, you see everything around you as an opportunity to love him more, to glorify him more. Now you approach every facet of your life. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 makes sense. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, you do it all for the glory of God because you're driven by love of God. I, I, this is my big concern when I hear those stats. It just seems to me like many professing Christians don't know that kind of experience of God's love. Many professing Christians love the things of the world so much because they know the love of God so little. So just follow it. Many of us are living like we believe the ways of this world are better than the ways of God. Being good at sports, better in church. Enjoying this momentary pleasure better than obedience to intimacy with God. Like, I just go on and on and on and on. Just look at our lives. And 1 John 2.15 is telling us that if we would just realize the greatness of God's love for us, when the love of the Father is in you, he will take away your love for the things of this world. He will sh- you'll see they're empty compared to him. You'll see that he's so much better. So that's the pastoral pleading, just to believe that God is better. The problem is, just to go back to where we started, so many of us, and just so you know, I include myself in this. So many of us, in so many different ways, are just right now tangled in a web of worldliness. And we wonder, how do we get out? We wonder, how, how do we love God and not the things in the world? At least I hope you're wondering this. If you're not, if you're at home with desire for the things of the world, that's far more alarming. But if in your heart you would say, you're hearing this word from God, you would say, I want to experience God's love like that in a way that frees me from love for the things of this world, then I want to encourage you. This is what being the church is all about. As a pastor, as members of this church, we want to help one another Love God, grow in our understanding of God's love for us in a way that radically changes our lives, our families, our future for our good, for his glory. That is a process over time, week by week as a church. But I would close today by saying that it starts right here. It starts by expressing this desire to God. It starts with you, with me, with us saying, God, I, God, we, You just say in your life, God, I want you. I want to love you. I don't want to love the things in this world. They're passing away. I want you, life in you. So help me. Help us. As you say this to God, then I just want to encourage you with everything else we've seen in 1 John today. Because you and I are going to fall short, but let's trust in Jesus alone as the Son of God, the Savior of our sin. Let's confess our sin to him, know that we're cleansed by him, and then by his grace, let's work to obey him 
alone as the Lord of our lives, the Lord of your life. Let's, let's open up his word, see what it says about money, see what it says about sexuality, see what it says about anger and lust and marriage and parenting. Let's, let's not buy into everything this world is selling. Let's dive into this word and say, all right, so on our own, together, let's dive into this word and let's prioritize it like it's life. Like it's life. Like more than anything else, this word is life. Let's ask God to give us that kind of life and his kind of love for those around us. Let's ask God to give us radical, sacrificial, selfless love for those in need around us. And all of that, let's experience in the process God's love for us. Knowing we're forgiven of our sins. We have fellowship with God. We know God and we have overcome the evil one. Today, God's word is holding eternal life out to us. To you. And when I say that, like, please don't just think about heaven. Some of you this whole time have been thinking, I just want to know if I'm going to heaven. Just tell me how I can make sure I'm going to be there. Where's, where's the box? Just, I just want to make sure I'm there. Ladies and gentlemen, heaven is not the goal. God is the goal. The question is not, do you want heaven? The question is, do you want God? Because if you don't want God, then you won't have heaven. It's the whole point. Eternal life is found in God. And it's not just in the future. It's right now. So do you want God right now? Eternal life is depending on answering that question. For all who do, then I exhort you, trust in Jesus alone as the Son of God and the Savior of your sins. Some, maybe many of you have never done that. I urge you to do that today. Like that is the beginning of the Christian life, but it is not the end. You trust in Jesus and then keep trusting in Jesus as your Savior, as you obey Jesus as your Lord. You show his love to others by the power of his life in you. And in all of this, you experience God's love in your heart. For this is eternal life. And you will know, you will know you have it. You'll know you have it. So, will you bow your heads with me? I sh- I just want to ask you those questions as you bow your heads here at other congregations. Are you trusting in Jesus alone as the Son of God and the Savior of your sin? Are you obeying, desiring to obey, working to obey Jesus as the Lord of your life? Are you showing God's love to others and are you experiencing God's love in your life? Obviously, I don't know where everybody is right now. But I, I just want to encourage everybody, regardless of where you are, to go to Jesus. To say, help us. God, I pray that right now that Even in this moment right now, some, maybe many people are just going to you and trusting you to save them from their sins. And others are saying, I want to be, I want to experience life like this. Lord, wean me off the ways of this world, the things of this world. I want you more than I want anything in this world. God, I pray that you would make that. Our prayer that you'd help us, help us in this way and make us a church that's helping one another in this way. Help us to help each other to love you and experience your love for us and show your love to others in a way that makes the things and the ways of this world look empty as they are. Lord, guard us from deception, we pray. Help us to know that we have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.